For filmmaker Kevin McTurk's unique puppet films, characters are brought to life through a marriage of marvelous design and skilled puppetry. Kevin's collaborators in engineering those puppets have a deep pedigree in the special effects world and include my friends Pete Abramson and Mark Satrakian from Spectral Motion. Hey everybody, Adam Savage. I am at Spectral Motion in Los Angeles with my friend Pete Abramson. Dude, how are you? It's very good. Uh, you good. might know Pete from BattleBots, but we have been friends for over two and a half decades. Yeah, Robot Wars. I Robot think Wars, the man. The original the Mark Thorpe. Yes, dude. Yes, um, you have been working on some mechanisms with Kevin McTurk. Yes. Um, so. I have sort of stepped out of the film business some years back and right. I started working mostly in robotics and technical stuff, but Kevin keeps me back in the space. <laughs> so just when you so thought you were out, he pulls you back he in. He does. Well, he called me up and basically said, hey, could you make a little thing for me? And I was like, this was back in his very first film like 10 plus years ago. Yeah. And I was like, is it for free? Yeah, <laughs> totally, I'm there, I'm totally down, let's go do this. So like, it's been great. We've been building puppets together for a long time and one of the sort of deeper dive into the puppets was with the Haunted Swordsman. He yeah. said, hey, I'm gonna make this great samurai film. And of course, all of us being Kurosawa fans went like, yes, right. let's make that. I wanna make a samurai film. Um, you must have also been excited when he told you that the scale is yes, as large the, I as mean, it The is. puppets are like this perfect space where I can fit servos or mechanisms in them but they're not full human size so that we can actually carry them and work with them. So the weights they work with are much less than normal. Exactly, and we're not trying to make a little teeny miniature this big, do all the little things. It's not Stuart Middle, you know? Right, it's like right. It's something bigger. Uh, so Luke Conley and who I've done most of this with, we sort of had a epiphany of, you know, we have a water jet at work. We should be using our water jet. And how can we flat pack everything that we can uh, do. So, so instead all, of milling all the parts, you're making them flat and building them in layers. Exactly. <gasps> it was all about sort of how can I just Ikea this? And so everything about this was as minimal post machining or full block machining right. as possible. So I kind of started with a lot of flat shapes and I'd made the wrist rotation with this hinge very specifically for the samurai yeah. um, because- And it's and, just a compliant little piece of plastic here. Oh yeah, it's just a piece of nylon. Not a hinge. That I, I laser cut and just put Dacron and Spectra fishing line are like my two favorite things. I love I them for cable operations. Totally understand. Oh my God, that's so, this is so simple. It makes me feel a little dumb. And I don't know what I quite mean by that, but it's just that <laughs> I, like even in my rudimentary machining, I would have gone way more elaborate and the simplicity of this is so good. It was really easy. And so one of the things with relation to the samurai, and we'll bring Ron back into this conversation. Yeah. Like Ron has taught me so much. Like, <laughs> um, the key was the sword. Okay. Was we wanted the sword strike. And I don't have that direction of wrist right, in this. Right. So I built, because I'm flat packed, I can make a parallelogram yep. down the line of all this and be able to get this awesome sword strike. So that the puppeteer knows exactly the attitude of the sword. Ding. Not yes. the wrist. Oh. Exactly. Exactly. So like we could. You know, do that this is nice. a great way to, to bring the performance to what matters in the shot. And. We, as we sort of have moved from this into the next film that we're doing with Kevin, I mean, Ron going, hey, you know, these hinges were really limiting for the elbow. Like oh. having this really hard 90 degree hinge right, was really right. limiting. So he said, things I've done back in puppeteering is I've used pieces of rope or string, I've used all these mm -hmm. different things. So the next stage Ooh. was this little cable hinge that sure, it's not, perfect, right. but it allows so much more movement yeah. for Ron to puppeteer with. And then of course, 3D printing, you know, I started making cable blocks and stuff out of oh, the yeah. 3D prints. <laughs> so and the shoulders were, were just rope, yeah. you know, allows us a huge amount of pivot and rotation. It's so funny because I think that people looking at it would think of those as primitive engineering solutions, but in fact, for what you need, this is what's required. And other elements were all of these points were adjustable so that I can undo some bolts, rotate the angle, so that if Ron is under the table and, and has to, he doesn't right. need a straight stick. Like all gotcha. of this stuff, the handles move, 
and the oh right, you can arm, change the tension on the spectra here. Tenor, I can move like whether it needs to be ninety degrees straight on. All of this was crucial to thinking about how is the performance going to yeah. happen, and so that was with a, was a lot of time spent on set with Ron about yeah. what are we doing and right. Ron going. I can't reach, I can't get the performance to do this. So it's like, hey, you know, if I go back, I could rechange that. Right. And that's how a lot of this came about. So that now with the new ghost stories for Iceland, yeah. we were able to sort of really change what we're doing with the puppeteering. I love that, like, we all have bodies and we know how they can move and we can try and imitate that, but it takes a puppeteer's institutional knowledge of like what it was to get this shot under these conditions. Right, that that gets you to these really yeah. versatile solutions. And again, all water jet with right. very minimal things. Like I just tapped holes, basically. <sighs> this is probably the most complex piece here, where I drilled the other direction. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah, so. Bold. Bold. Oh man, here I'll, I'll. This is so beautiful. I so an engineer once told me that he had a water cutter, and he said, "I now view the world only as water cutting and TIG welding." My, <laughs> when I first started working at a place called Applied Mines and they had a water jet cutter, it changed everything about how I designed. Wow. Like my whole world, I just sort of threw out and restarted thinking about, well, how do I make this flat first? Yeah. Because it, it does things like this. It allows me so much versatility in what I'm doing rather than, I mean, I used to go to the mill and basically sculpt a piece of metal yes. on, on the vice, right? <laughs> totally. I don't need to do that anymore. Nor do you need to be as rigid as we've all overly been in our mechanical yes. excursions. Wow, dude. That is just thrillingly, thrillingly simple. Um, I'm curious, is the reason for the compliant plastic in here instead of a hinge because it has a little bit of its own natural spring to center? Um, also, because ah. I can just beat on it. Like, right. right, this thing can just take a beating that, that soft, it, it was a little nicer rather than having a very rigid pin. You know, it just sort of became a little more flexible and more compliant. I think that I, I, I've always had, uh, I've always sort of, my engineering skills have always sort of fallen down when it comes to remote operation. For some reason I can't picture, but I think one of my issues is I'm going way too rigid in my, in my thinking process. This changes so much about what I think is possible. Well, you got to remember, I grew up with Mark's attraction. Right? And <laughs> oh, so my first jobs were also with working with Mark, and that man can make things move, right? And it's just annoying. watching it's him <laughs> design a thing to move and understand how what we're making is about movement. Right. So that was always the end product was what is the movement in the end? Like not how do I make something, oh, wow, yeah. So, you're right, that's the first principle. This is a necessary movement. On a box. Dude, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank this you, I was really, finally glad really to be on awesome. testing with you and hanging out with it's you. It's ridiculous again. that you haven't been before. <laughs> we'll make it happen more often. <laughs> so uh, Mark, Kevin McTurk has conscripted you to build some stuff for his films. Well, I wouldn't say conscripted, you know, I've been watching from the sidelines yeah. while Kevin's been making these incredible films for years. And finally he's like, oh, I have this boat. You know, is there some way that you can, I, I see him like looking at this like, oh yeah, I think I can, I think I can help with that. So you've been wanting, send me in coach. Is yeah, what you've been exactly, thinking. exactly. And so, uh, am I looking at a, a Stuart platform? So basically, yes. Yeah. So what you're looking at, we've got two things going on here. Oh. Um, oh. There is a, a little tiny motion base that is uh, moving the boat. I've got some, uh, algorithmic motion that is creating some level of, uh, of C motion. So like right now, this is just what we call calm seas. And now I'm gonna go to stormy seas. And uh, puppeteering is Luke's son here. Right, and so uh, Leo's gonna add more animation on top of this with a joystick. So we want like, a, like the, the boat to hit a wave and like right. crest it or something like that. You have this manual control in addition to the, the waves that are being generated by the control system. I'm curious, is that a regular part of your animatronic programming to have a base animation that you puppeteer on top of? Yes, that has become very much part of my, my go-to. So for example, like for the creatures for um, the Tomorrow War, 
you know, the thing comes to life and it's breathing and it's agitated and it's like twitching and there's all this stuff going on yeah. and like the 100% alive. And then you, you puppeteer on top of that. Right, right, right. So you can basically uh, establish a, a baseline of life that otherwise you would be spending a lot of energy just just coordinating having all other that. people doing all sorts right. of right right and that kind of or even you and that, that yeah. takes it out of the, out of the equation so you can kind of dial in some level of motion um, and then embellish on top of it so i'm curious how where that first motion comes from are you just thinking about the the, the what the boat is doing and adding in you know maybe this kind of rock and then yeah, building it you know it's it's a little bit it's a little bit made up but but the motion of the boat was actually inspired by um, these stories that are read about Pacific Islanders who would navigate across the ocean in their canoes. My favorite navigators and the stories of them just blow my mind. So they would like lie in the, the belly of the, of the boat and feel the waves and they would feel the orientation of the waves and they knew that much like a pond with you drop a rock in that a piece of land has these radial waves coming off of it, and they would turn into those waves and find land that way. And their maps were descriptions of wave directions. Right. Yes, there were like sticks on a square that were somehow helped them find Hawaii and, and crap like and that's that. That's how I came up with that. Amazing. <laughs> so, so it's sine waves, and it's sine waves coming from different directions and at different amplitudes. Okay. So you've got, so like if, Leo, let's go for a second. Um, I go back to calm seas for a moment. So you've got, um, a, a dominant wave kind of coming from this direction at yeah. one frequency, but then there's another one coming from another direction at a, slight, a much lower frequency. Right. Right. So there's also a little bit of roll and a little bit of heave, and it's like you get these 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 three or four different sine waves that are all at different amplitudes and different frequencies going together, and they're not locked to each other. No, they're dynamically no, they're, they're freely they're Amazing. freely running uh, independently of each other. Also, um, if I'm not this is this a synthesizer basically. Right. Right. Yeah. A physical motion synthesizer. It's a motion synthesizer. Yeah, baby. Um, it also strikes me as none of this is very exotic hardware. No. These no. are, these I mean, are, these are, might be fancy servos, but such a thing could be done for, you know, such a hundred bucks or something. Absolutely. In fact, you can go on, well, I don't know if you still can, but um, there are uh, tutorials online for how to, um, how to make things like, like hobby servo motion bases. Amazing. And people make all sorts of cool things. They make things like... Um, uh, you know, a plate, you can drop a marble on it and it'll roll around and keep the marble in the center. You know, yeah. these are like the, the things that hobbyists do, right, right. you know, and then I'm the beneficiary of that to some extent because it's like, okay, well, um, yeah, there's this lever and you just kind of work out the math. It's not easy, honestly. Yeah. Uh, the math isn't, not for me, I'm not that great at it, but I, I make stuff like this to force myself to learn the math. <laughs> um, it, it must be thrilling to see a shot with your animation in oh. it, does it, do you, are you, do you are able to have a suspension of disbelief and forget that you did the programming? Yeah. yeah. A little bit? Yeah, yeah, and because there's so much else going on. Yeah. There's, I mean, I mean, just look at the boat, look at the ice crystals, look at the... No, I know, the, and occasionally like these move, as this moving, it just, yeah. I'm totally sold, even here in this non-set environment. Yeah. That is so beautiful. Can I see some more of your <laughs> Yeah, go for it. And then there's a, another feature, which is a filter on the joysticks, which keeps the movements of the joysticks in the realm of the frequency of the waves ah, that are coming in. Oh, nice. So it's hard to screw up. Right, right. Basically. Um, so you've been doing this for decades. Mm. Uh, and I know that like modern Raspberry Pis and modern servos make this a lot easier than it was decades ago. But I'm curious about uh, the, the base animation. Like, were, th were there really weird ways you, were, you had to achieve that back in the day? Yeah, because before I started coding, every kinematic problem had a mechanical solution. I had to make a mechanical thing that would do that. Wow. And once I started coding, the mechanisms became as simple as possible. Just like very, very simple. And then a lot of that um, complexity then came from the software. Amazing. So having a good grounding in mechanical design is, is great when you're writing code because you make an informed decision about, well, what portion of this is gonna be handled by the mechanism and what portion is gonna be handled by the software? Yeah. And then you can get something that is a great synergy of both of those things. Is there a, 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 I'm sure that the ability to code has improved for you in the basic software platforms, but is there still some uh, aspect that you're, that you're wanting to pull out of that relationship between the mechanical and the software? Well, I really need to start doing uh, embedded microcontroller programming because right now all of the 
motion of this boat, for example, is coming off of this laptop. Right. And this is the user interface that I created, and um, this is great, but I can't run this here on right. this. Um, it to, needs yeah. this amount of compute. It needs that amount of compute. And, uh, and this is great because I can, I can modify this like while a shot is being shot. I can like open up the hood and like change stuff, and I've done that. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but this is extremely quick to work with in like a film production environment right. where I'm not stuck with, oh, I have to recompile this and upload it into the, into the microcontroller. But once you're trying to make a, a robot that has its own internal control loops and things that require a very, very fast uh, communication between the servos and the controller, that's when something like this becomes less practical. I see. And you want it to all be on board the actual device. Or at least the important part to be right. on board. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. And, so, we're get, and we're getting there. Yeah. Spectral motion, you know, we're absolutely getting there. There's much smarter kids than, than I am, and they're, they're here working on stuff like that. So, so uh, after spending so many, uh, uh, so many years on set, are there aspects of working at this scale that you find particularly pleasurable? Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Because it's not a common scale for movies. No, no. And uh, it's with something like this, like building, building something like this and making changes to it, it's trivial. The, the stakes are low when right. you're working at this scale. The right. stakes right. are low. You know, and the bigger something gets, it's exponentially a bigger deal. And it can start to tear itself apart. Yes, and you also. And <laughs> yeah, you with it. Oh, this is thrilling. Thank you, man. This is beautiful. My pleasure. Thank you guys so much for watching that video. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you we have some excellent merch. We have a five pack of demerit badges for sale right now at tested slash store.com. We've got the I hung it off of level demerit badge, the I built the chair backwards demerit badge, the I hit my thumb with a hammer demerit badge. We've got the stapler in my finger demerit badge and my favorite, I stuck the duct tape to itself demerit badge. Get yours now, tested slash store dot store dash store, tested dash store, Tested. It's right here. There, just click that. <laughs>